It was fascination, I know. Tired. Nangtayo'y magsama-sama Sa buhay at pakikibaka Walang hindi magagawa Lahat ng bagay ay malilikha Sahod, trabaho at ang karapatan Sinupil ng dayuhan, estatut dilawan Manggagawang nagdusa sa pagsasamantala Sa union at sa welga, lahat nagkaisa Manggagawa, tipunin ang lakas Buong tatag at ngayon'y magbalikwas Walang hindi makakamit kung tayo'y magkakaisa Sama-sama sa buhay at pakikibaka Walang hindi magagawa Lahat ng bagay ay malilikha Magkapit, bisig at tayo'y tumindig Pinag-isang tinig ating ibarinig Sa ganit na imperialistang salot ng daigdig Lilipulin ang lahat at ating madadai Manggagawa, tipunin ang lakas Buong tatagat, ngayon'y magbalikwas Walang hindi makakamit kung tayo'y magkakaisa Ah, demokrasya at kalayaan Ay ating makakamtan Sosyalist ang pagbabago ay katiyakan Manggagawa ang mahawa ng daan nang tayo'y magsama-sama Sa buhay at pakikibaka Walang hindi magagawa Lahat ng bagay ay malilikha Nang tayo'y magsama-sama Sa buhay at pakikibaka Walang hindi magagawa Lahat ng bagay ay malilikha lahat tayo ngayon ay lalaya. Good afternoon, international comrades and migranteng kababayan. At magandang gabi naman po sa inyo dyan sa Pilipinas. Mapagpalayang pagbati po sa ating lahat. Welcome back to the National Democratic Online School and welcome to our new series, uh, series of international discussion with Tito Jo. It is entitled The Labor Serie, featuring the works and ideas of Karl Marx. This is to remember and celebrate and, uh, and to continue the fight in the month of our, for our workers that started this 1st of May, which is the Labor Day. So this series will go on for the next three weeks, just like the Lenin Serie, every Sunday, 3 p.m. Europe time. So make sure to note this on your calendars and click the notification bell for updates on our Facebook group, National Democratic Line Online to be updated sa aming series na gaganapin. So please invite your comrades, your friends and family to participate in this event dahil mas, mas lumalakas kapag mas marami. No? Today, we will be discussing wage, labor, and capital, which Karl Marx wrote around April 1849. This is directed at workers as part of Marx's fight for the political independence of the working class in the revolution. So uh, general house rules lang mga kasama. Um, please turn your microphone to mute and your disable your camera sa ating Skype group uh, para we can avoid disruptions and feedbacks and background noises. So if you have, uh, for our audience, if you have questions to Tito Jo, so please drop it on the comments. So later on, we will have an open floor session where Tito Jo could answer your questions. Ano? So um, um, uh, please, uh, mga revolutionary youth, ano pang hinihintay natin? Tara na. At mag-aral at simulan ang discussion na ito. So uh, please welcome again, Filipino writer, activist, internationalist, and NDFP consultant, Professor Joma Season. Hi, Tito! Uh, welcome back po again. Kamusta po kayo? Mabuti naman. Uh, thank you, Angelo, for introducing me. Uh, I'm uh, glad to greet uh, 
um, the youth and all fellow activists. And today, uh, at the start of this uh, new series on Marx, so uh, this is a, a privilege, uh, an honor, and uh, I would like to continue sh sharing ideas with you. Thank you, Tito. No? So um, without further ado, Tito, let's start the discussion. So um, my first question would be, yeah. um, um, could you explain the labor power and how does it differ from labor? So, and uh, could you also please explain um, the wages as defined by Marx? Well, um, labor power is the capacity of the workers to exert physical and mental effort uh, to produce goods for use and exchange in society. It is uh, measurable in terms of hours uh, within a work day or within long periods of time. You know, in uh, earlier times when the trade union movement was not yet well developed, people in the uh, first half of the 19th century were compelled to work uh, for as long as up to uh, 16 hours, no? Uh, by the end of the 19th uh, century in Europe, uh, well, that was reduced to some around 10. But uh, it would be in the um, um, 20th century when the eighth hour law would be uh, adopted. I mentioned uh, a bit of this history uh, to show that measuring labor power uh, by the hours uh, uh, in every day is uh, is uh, quite a standard, no? And um, now uh, we must understand that the capitalist the buys labor power as some kind of commodity, and of course the capitalist uh, would make someone work for so many hours even if it would take only three to six hours for the workers to earn enough for their means of subsistence. You see, um, uh, as a commodity, labor power has to be replenished at every day. The worker has to uh, have some shelter, he must have food, he must be able to sleep and take a rest and come back to, for work. So he needs the, the means of subsistence. Now, um, uh, so, the capitalist uh, will take, uh, let us say, uh, eight hours of work, uh, to use current terms. Uh, the capitalist would take, uh, uh, would pay for eight hours, but you know, the wages he gives uh, would be um, uh, enough for the subsistence of the worker, and um, it would be equivalent only to a few hours. Uh, and the capitalist takes um, uh, most of the uh, values created uh, in the rest of the workday. Um, I'm uh, discussing in advance, you know, uh, how labor power uh, creating values uh, uh, will be the subject of exploitation. But uh, let's focus on uh, the drift on the terms labor power in Tagalog, lakas paggawa. Now, uh, uh, how is it different from the word labor? You know, traditionally, um, before Marx um, uh, pinned down or uh, put forward the term labor power, and then he uh, related this to uh, the explanation about uh, ex exploitation, uh, labor was uh, used in a loose way. But then it meant uh, uh, the, the classical economists uh, meant by labor uh, still the, the activity by which uh, the workers uh, produce commodities, uh, that means say goods for exchange in the market no? and in society at large. Um, in Tagalog, uh, uh, Labor translates to paggawa. So may pagkakaiba yung ano, lakas paggawa. Uh, there is a certain precision in the term lakas paggawa. Um, sometimes uh, labor uh, means so much in general terms that it can refer to the labor movement. No? 
like the British Labour Party, it's already refers to the whole party. But Labour, uh, for our purposes of discussion and for pur purposes of distinguishing it from Labour power, means the activity by which the workers produced commodities. Uh, the term, uh, the two terms were used uh, alternatively, um, synony al almost synonymously, but it would take Marx, uh, who would make some advances in uh, studying um, uh, the laws of motion of capitalism, would explain um, why it is important to use the term labor. Um, you see, in the 1949 uh, manuscript, uh, or articles of uh, Marx, which appeared at the, in the Neue uh, Rheinische Zeitung. Uh, actually, Le Marx himself used the term labor, and uh, only in subsequent articles did he use uh, labor power. So, um, uh, with much justification, Engels. Uh, uh, in compiling the articles of 1849 uh, to make the pamphlet uh, under the title um, under the title wage labor and capital he replaced uh, the original word of uh, uh, march la simply labor so he replaced it with the word uh, with the phrase labor power and that's in accordance anyway with uh, the development of the language of Marx which, with regard to labor and labor power. So, uh, I will explain um, uh, in more substantive terms uh, how labor was, uh, we, uh, was a term used by the classical economist and later on Marx would introduce labor power as the more precise term and it has uh, uh, a connection uh, to the question ultimately of exploitation. It's a question of uh, um, how much of the uh, how much of the socially necessary average labor time that the worker renders uh, is enough to um, to uh, equate no with the wages paid. Uh, and then, uh, what about the rest of uh, the material values created by labor power? Well, that's uh, taken by the capitalists, and that's what is called surplus value. But uh, I'm speaking in, uh, ahead, no? Um, so we will uh, be able to understand these terms more clearly, especially labor power and all its ramifications as we proceed in our interview. We can now proceed to the second question. Hello, Tito. Uh, sorry about that. No, um, uh, next question, Tito, would be how does Marx's explanation differ from classical economists? Hmm. Well, like, say Marx, kasundo niya yung classical economist in uh, using... Uh, the term labor uh, at, uh, at the start, and um, he uh, saw the validity in the use of the term uh, labor to refer uh, to uh, um, to refer to the source of material values, new material values uh, that uh, arise because of the work done by the workers. Uh, different from the prior values of things taken from nature, uh, the natural, uh, the, the raw materials that you get, the, or the objects of labor that you get from nature, or from previous, uh, from the previous uh, production of the uh, capital equipment, and uh, of course the raw materials uh, that are the subject, uh, that become the, the object of work of the workers in order to produce new material values by virtue of his labor power. Anyway, um, uh, economists like uh, uh, Adam Smith 
and Raven Ricardo simply meant that, uh, well, um, uh, new material values are created by uh, uh, the workers and uh, uh, these are uh, subject to the law of supply and demand and uh, uh, the, the workers and the capitalists can be happily together. Eh? They, they, they had no uh, uh, intention of uh, 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 let us say uh, uh, explaining uh, the phenomenon of exploitation between the, the workers and capitalists. They were all interested in the uh, in the case of Adam Smith. He was just interested. Well, um, if you have a certain commodity, you can exchange it uh, with another commodity and uh, uh, units of the di two different com uh, commodities would uh, e equal each other by consideration of the uh, work days uh, that uh, had been put into the making of, the, uh, of each commodity. And then uh, in the case of David Ricardo, he was more elaborate. As a matter of fact, uh, the uh, so-called theory, theory of value is, uh, ex is uh, elaborated on by him. And uh, he, he satisfies himself with saying, well, uh, when you have a commodity that is offered in the market, it is a combination of labor uh, plus the uh, equipment and the raw materials. And... Uh, of um, the uh, the values from the labor of the workers is added to the um, uh, labor that is that has been imparted no? uh, in the uh, uh, the equipment and the raw materials, and of course, uh, of course, you don't. Uh, you don't use up a machine uh, and equipment uh, in one period of production. Uh, economists can compute the, you know, the degree of depreciation uh, periodically. But anyway, uh, let's not go be complicated about uh, this. Uh, uh, David Ricardo simply meant that uh, uh, there is labor uh, imparted <coughs> uh, to a commodity. So. Um, uh, Marx uh, used the term. Um, it would be later on uh, be that he would uh, uh, explain, uh, he would put forward the term labor power and explain how more precise and useful a term it is. So, um, anyway, of the, the uh, uh, classical economists make clear that uh, the value of a commodity is the product of uh, labor that has been imparted uh, into things. Now, um, I will explain, I will, be, I will now begin to explain how the, um, Marx made a significant contribution, um, made an advance on the, the theorizing about labor as a source of uh, value. So let me now explain. Uh, you see, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in the writings of uh, Marx, it is clear that wages which take the form of money to pay for a certain, uh, uh, for, for, let's say, to buy the entire um, uh, working time of the workers, uh, is just enough uh, to cover uh, the uh, means of consumption. Uh, paid labor is, all, is equivalent, the value of the wage labor, paid labor, or the wages which the worker gets, but which as is supposed to pay for all his work time in a day or in whatever certain period we're talking about, um, um, 
is a small part of the total amount of value created by the workers. Say, let's in a day. Um, the paid labor or the wages could amount to only three hours of work, let us say. So if the uh, work time in a day, uh, let us say, is uh, eight hours, uh, five hours, the values created in um, um, in five hours uh, is what is called surplus value, and that uh, that is the source of the profit of uh, the capitalist. You see, surplus value um, is divisible into industrial profit, uh, the interest paid by the capitalist to the banks, and uh, the uh, the money uh, paid for the rent of the uh, site uh, of the of the of the plant. So, so uh, this way, Marx uh, by differentiating uh, um, uh, paid uh, uh, let's say uh, paid labor. Uh, and the surplus value beyond that, uh, Marx was able to demonstrate, uh, was able to uh, bring out the basis of exploitation. So it, it's very important to, to understand how the, the, the total amount of values created by, by the workers is divided. And uh, uh, in the production process itself, uh, the profit is already extracted. Uh, usually people think, oh, the capitalist must first bring the commodity to the market where he will real he will make the sale and then he will realize his profit there. No, right there in the factory um, through uh, the exploitation of uh, labor power with the capitalist taking most of the values created by the labor power of the workers, he already gets his profits. Um, so that is the main point. Um, I think uh, we, um, the uh, big contribution of uh, Marx after Ricardo in the theorizing about labor uh, is, you know, uh, the theory of surplus value. That's the key, eh? key contribution. Yan ang uh, susing uh, ambag ni uh, Marx sa pagtiteorya tungkol sa, o pag-analisa at pagtiteorya tungkol sa ano, uh, paggamit tungkol sa penomenon at paggamit ng tinawag na lakas paggawa. Uh, uh, we have discussed the point uh, well enough. Uh, we can proceed to another. Retito. Um, on the side of the workers, naman, no, do they have interest in the rapid growth of capital as it will improve also their conditions? For example, tito dito sa Europe, uh, most workers get certain benefits in addition to their salary per hour. Like for example, the vacation pay or sick pay. Oh, of course, up to a certain point, uh, there is uh, some kind of mutual benefit between the capitalist and uh, workers. Uh, after all, you know, capitalism is to, supposed to be an advance on the feudalism, but, you know, this is a new kind of uh, uh, slavery. It's wage uh, slavery. But uh, um, while capitalism was uh, uh, gaining ground, uh, there uh, was very much the appearance that there was mutual benefit uh, uh, in the whole of the uh, 19th century, the classical economists would think there is mutual benefit, then they did not touch the question of exploitation. So, uh, what uh, is the benefit that um, the capitalist gets from the working class? The capitalist gets accumulates or gets his profit from the surplus value and um, um, accumulates capital thereby. And of course, the worker gets the, uh, his wages, uh, 
that correspond to a part of the uh, uh, entire amount of labor time that he uh, gave in a day, he gets uh, uh, the wages in order to subsist. Um, so, and the worker would think uh, he's, uh, he's uh, uh, especially uh, without the uh, any trade union movement, and let us say you have a newly dispossessed peasant who becomes a, a worker in the early 19th century, you'll even be happy to have a job. And of course, the capitalists kept on abusing, and uh, the, the capitalists uh, 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 kept on hiring people, buying their labor power, uh, men, women, and even children. And uh, uh, that served to uh, that served to increase their profits and uh, uh, and accumulate capital. So you see the. Uh, mutual benefit side and at the same time the exploitative side of the relationship between capitalists and workers. Um, uh, and then you know um, the uh, while every capitalist will try uh, to get the surplus value from workers in every uh, in every uh, factory or enterprise, um, there is also a competition uh, among the capitalists. And uh, they try to compete in uh, uh, drawing more uh, more uh, surplus value from the workers. So you know, uh, uh, growth of the economy uh, does not necessarily mean improvement of the condition of the workers, because the competition among the capitalists uh, wouldn't would involve also. Every capitalist trying to reduce uh, what they call uh, the cost of production, especially the variable money, um, variable capital that is intended for hiring people. So the <laughs> the, the tendency is uh, uh, the tendency is for for the wage level to be pressed down by the competition of the capitalists. Uh, but then. Uh, you know, this sort of thing happens all the time if uh, the working class uh, does not uh, become conscious of its condition and does not resist. So the the, the worker, the working class arose uh, as a um, as a force in itself, no, uh, as a thing in itself, you might say, um, and it, it was even brought uh, forth by the capitalist class. Huh? Uh, the capitalist class would hire people who, have, who are jobless from the farms or what, uh, uh, from the urban slums. And uh, so it, the capitalist class practically creates, creates the, uh, the working class. And uh, the working class comes into existence uh, in itself. Huh? It becomes a class in itself. Now, but because of the exploitation, the workers decide to form trade unions. At first, they are assisted by you know, young charitable people like the Chartists, but then they think of forming their own uh, organizations for economic struggle, for waging, for uh, pressing for wage increases and improvement of their uh, uh, living conditions. So uh, the trade union movement is the first step in the advance of the working class towards being a class for itself, yeah? para sa kanyang interes nagbuo ng ano, unions, so that uh, if the strong, if the union movement is strong, then the the, the workers can um, can uh, uh, demand higher wages. Kung walang mga union, mahirapan na magdemand, no? Yung one, the divide and rule lang sila ng mga kapitalista. So they have to unite in trade unions. But trade unions are not enough. So uh, formation of the part of the working class uh, with a stronger uh, political motivation, uh, ranging from trying to make social reforms to trying to evolve socialism, ganun mga ideas nila. Then up to the level of ano, the revolutionary party of the proletariat uh, uh, that was called for by the uh, Communist Manifesto. Um, 
the, the, the working class party for the socialist revolution is the party that has the strongest character. And, uh, but anyway, uh, that kind of party arises first as a legal party uh, for social reforms and so on. Uh, but then, uh, with the combination of a uh, militant uh, uh, proletarian party in the trade union movement, yeah, you have a stronger force that uh, puts pressure on the capitalist class to improve the conditions of uh, the working class. But you know, in a capitalist, in the capitalist class, so long as it is, as the class dictatorship of the bourgeoisie is not yet uh, overthrown, um, <clears throat> the bourgeoisie would have its way. And the only thing that, um, uh, let us say, uh, a major part of the existence of bourgeois society, you know, is the competition among the um, among the uh, capitalists. The capitalists would tend to uh, keep on accumulating on the side of what they call uh, constant capital uh, in order to be able to compete against other capitalists. The cap one set of capitalists would um, uh, build up its plant, its equipment, its capacity to uh, put together uh, 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 the raw materials. And then it presses down, they press down the, the wage level. So what happens? Uh, production may increase, but then uh, because of overproduction, they would appear first, the falling rate of profit, no? Because anyway, uh, the capitalists are producing the same thing uh, in uh, uh, much beyond demand, no? Uh, so uh, the supply is uh, too too big, too much bigger than the demand. Uh, the the you know, the profit rate would fall, and then <laughs> a key a key factor in the. Um, in the decrease of demand is that the workers uh, are given so low wages that they can afford to buy their own products. No? Uh, they, you know, because uh, the capitalists, in order to have more capital for uh, uh, what you call uh, the constant side of it, uh, uh, in uh, equipment, raw material, and so on, uh, and there is uh, the pressing down of the variable capital for wages, then uh, the workers themselves uh, cannot afford. So th uh, the problem of having uh, um, lesser demand for more supply would hit the uh, would hit the economic system, and that's that's where you get the repeated crisis in uh, the capitalist system. Um, anyway, <laughs> I think it was enough for me to explain that. Right. Uh, uh, what is the mutual benefit of the working class and uh, uh, and uh, the workers? So I've demonstrated, yes, up to a certain point. But you must understand that uh, it leads to exploitation and more exploitation, and it even leads to the crisis of the capitalist system. Uh -huh. um, Tito, let me clarify. <laughs> Hello, Tito. Hello. Um, let me clarify, no, Tito. Um, Usually, these benefits, no, like for example, the vacation leave, it was um, it was won by uh, it it is not given by the capitalist really, no. Parang is it um, this is won by the union, the trade unions as their right, hindi po ba? Number four, na. Hindi po. Yung benefits daw po uh, won by the trade union, not well, even. You know, in a uh, uh, when we shall take up the uh, 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 speech of Marx before the in, uh, in first uh, uh, International Working Men's Association, uh, when he debated the uh, proposition of Weston that if workers uh, if workers demand. Uh, uh, higher wages, and they get the higher wages. Uh, the capitalists will make the price of co the commodities that they need higher, 
And so, that's supposed to defeat eh, the interest of the working class. But Marx said, no, um, it, it's right there in the factory. The bone of contention is, the right, is right there in the factory. Uh, there must be the trade union movement and a political party to make sure that the workers get more, uh, a, a, a bigger share of, uh, of what they actually produce, you know? Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very important for the workers to, to struggle. Uh, they cannot be passive uh, because of the fear that if, they, if, uh, if uh, uh, wages rise, then prices uh, of the things that they wish to buy would, uh, would rise. And, you know, uh, up to now, the bourgeois argument, especially among the neoliberals, is that, you know, oh, which level must be put down so the capitalists would have more money, more capital to invest and create more jobs, you know? Yeah, they make, they make the work, the capitalist class, the creator of jobs and the creator of wealth, you know? Uh, that is a perversion of the reality that it is, um, it is the working class that creates new material values, the equipment and raw materials, uh, that are in the possession, that are owned by the capitalists, cannot by themselves, cannot by themselves create new material values. Even if, uh, let us say, they use uh, robots, uh, uh, or the highest forms of automation and robots are used, you will still need workers to operate, to maintain and operate those robots. And by the way, you cannot really uh, kick out workers from the production process and replace them with robots because then nobody would buy your products. Huh? If you, if uh, let us say every enterprise uh, would kick out workers, then they destroy their own market. Huh? I use the, the very term that uh, often mesmerizes uh, the, 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 uh, the bourgeoisie in which they try to use uh, to mesmerize the people. So, you know, for the number four, huh? Only uh, So I, uh, that's uh, that's a point. The workers um, themselves had to um, to act for their interest, and uh, uh, they have uh, instruments uh, that they can develop: the trade union movement and uh, the party of the working class. All right, Tito. Thank you for clarifying that. So let uh, we will proceed to the uh, fourth question, no, Tito. The analysis of Marx on wage, labor, and capital came from the demographics of workers during the eighteen uh, uh, the eighteen hundreds, it um uh, or the eight the eighteen eighties. It centralizes more on production, factories, and manual laborers. So um today the rise of the industry or the corporate industries like call centers or uh, outsourcings made changes to the numbers of the working class, no. How does Marx's analysis on wage, labor, and capital still applies today? Well, you know, as before, um, uh, the terms concerning wage, labor, and capital remain valid uh, up to now. Um, you see, as I have already explained, no? uh, even in the time of the, ninth, of the 19th century, where you might say electromechanical and chemical processes uh, were used, as well as extremely long hours of work for men, women, and children, well, uh, it's clear there that uh, the new material values were created by the workers. And um, uh, right now, I don't think, even if with the, the so-called information technology, which accelerates production, communications, and distribution of goods, um, you still need people uh, to, to operate, to, to, you still need people to make the hardware, the hardware uh, uh, for the electronic equipment. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, such people, um, 
And you know, there is a, there would be a, prolifer, prolif, a proliferation of, of uh, business operations involving uh, the, um, uh, the commercial production and use of, uh, um, of uh, information technology. Um, and let us, let's consider, uh, some people uh, try to separate the white collars from the blue collars. The, the, sometimes they insult the blue collars that they are all muscles and uh, the, the white collars are the brainy ones. No, um, the, the workers, whether blue collars or white collars, use both their brain and, uh, and their uh, muscle power. And both types of workers, um, both type of workers uh, uh, do repetitious and stressful work, no? Let us say, uh, let's consider uh, the teacher. I would consider the teacher uh, a, a white collar because you know he he earns the salary. The, the term is a is just a uh, is distinguished supposedly from wage, huh? uh, with wage uh, uh, being nuanced as uh, uh, you know compensation for sweaty labor, no? But you see. A school teacher would make his uh, uh, his uh, uh, study plan. He would have to write uh, his uh, uh, his. Uh, I mean to say, he would have to prepare the lessons. And you might say that uh, takes a lot more of uh, brain power. But uh, you do this every semester. It's repetitious. Eh? You you don't invent knowledge eh, from semester to semester. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, and let's say those who work for BPO, well, uh, they do even more repetitious work, uh, stressful, and of course they cannot operate without the hardware previously made by the workers, and then they themselves are workers who must use the equipment, eh? the computer equipment. Even if they're only users, they're not makers of the, of the hardware, they're users. So it's people using the equipment. And then in the, in the office, there are things, there, uh, there are resources that need to be used, paper and uh, uh, whatever, even the coffee and so on. Huh? In other words, uh, and the meals that the uh, BPO workers would need huh? to eat. Oh, well, these are all products of, uh, of uh, workers in, in the whole system. There is an interweaving of commodities. And um, uh, the white collar or the blue collar worker will have to get uh, his uh, pay, his wage, in order to be able to sustain himself as a worker. Uh, and uh, that's the point. You, you cannot... Uh, uh, you cannot say that uh, uh, the blue, the white collars have ascended to some uh, uh, level in the stratosphere and they have nothing to do with things uh, that involve in the creation of material values. Uh, so <laughs> I think uh, whether the processes in the past, in the 19th century, consisted of electromechanical processes and chemical processes, even as there is much, this, this have not been dispensed with, you know, they're still being used, no? But uh, you have these accelerators uh, in the form of uh, higher technology, um, particularly information technology. Still, uh, uh, you have to deal with the use, with the creation, by workers of the, uh, the equipment, the operation of the equipment, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, um, we're talking about social production. Social production, you create more things that you yourself need. No? Uh, you know, when you create only uh, something that you need, or let's say you pick from nature that which is useful to you. Let's say if you go to the forest, 
you pick the berries for you to eat while you are there? Well, you are not making a commodity. Uh, but uh, when you make commodities for other people, uh, uh, you uh, produce, you, uh, let us say, if you make it a point to go for so many days for a whole season to collect so many berries so that you would bring uh, the berries to the market, that is already making a commodity and you exert labor, you know, going to the forest, picking the, picking the, uh, the berries, that means uh, exertion of a lot of uh, work time. And so, um, <clears throat> you're already engaged in commodity production, which has a social character. It is uh, that which you uh, pick from nature, uh, be, uh, gains what is called the uh, uh, exchange value. Yeah, in uh, um, mass production uh, of things, with the use of uh, electromechanical, chemical, biological, and uh, uh, electronic processes uh, involve uh, involve collective production of uh, great amounts of uh, goods, uh, which you may call kalakal, no? which you call commodities, goods that are sold. Eh? in the market to the public so uh, the same thing is obtained now as it was in the past all right next question tito um how does the wage labor and capital applies naman to the agricultural agricultural setting of the philippines um of course uh, wage labor and capital are terms that are useful in an analyzing no uh, 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 Philippine agriculture. Um, uh, there are some people, you know, uh, who think that the the peasantry is already uh, disappearing. But you know, these uh, statisticians of the government, or uh, let's say of the IMF uh, and other multi uh, uh, other uh, multilateral agencies of the imperialist. Uh, uh, would you know separate farm workers eh, from the peasantry because the the peasantry is uh, characterized by <clears throat> having a piece of land allotted by the landlord or a piece of land that he himself has owned owns and but he had to till it no he's then is a uh, he can be a small owner uh, cultivator and then if he does not get enough from, you know, being a tenant or being a small, uh, small peasant, uh, small owner of a piece of land, uh, you know, he has, to, um, he has to become a farm worker. His wife, his children, and he himself would augment their uh, meager income, insufficient income from their land uh, to work for other peasants or go to the plantations or the haciendas. So... Uh, <clears throat> I would say that there are two kinds of farm workers um, in the Philippines. Most of them are offshoots. They are still based. They still belong to the peasant class. Uh, but they, they become subject to uh, <clears throat> becoming wage labor. No, they, uh, they get wages. Uh, you know, in the relationship between tenant and landlord, the tenant pays a tribute to the landlord in the form of what you call rent, no? And, uh, uh, of course, the, uh, if the, 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 the peasant who owns a small piece of land may still be subject to taxation. Um, he himself uh, assumes uh, the responsibility for taxation. But in the case of farm workers, uh, even in this type of farm workers still belonging to the peasantry, <clears throat> Um, they receive wage labor, and they have to. Uh, they, they commit themselves uh, to a number of hours working uh, for the master, for the uh, for the plantation owner, or even for the middle peasants and rich peasants who need extra extra labor. Uh, the wage can be paid in cash, in cash if at uh, all. Uh, if the agricultural product. Uh, cannot be carried and stored by the 
by the farm worker, you know, you cannot uh, carry and store coconut and uh, what else? What? Uh, coconut. Uh, uh, hello? When uh, farm workers are paid in kind, uh, get it uh, in the form of staples like uh, rice and corn. They can be stored and they are uh, necessary for the daily necessities of the of the working class. Now let's go to the other kind of uh, type of uh, farm workers. They're much poorer. Uh, I mean, the farm the other type of farm workers are those who are uh, <coughs> uh, uh, employed in a, uh, a relatively stable manner in the haciendas or uh, then they attend to the farm machines and uh, farm machines uh, where the activities uh, you might say these are the farm workers that are similar to the farm workers in industrial capitalist countries and um, uh, the uh, majority type of farm workers in the Philippines usually become farm workers uh, seasonally seasonally um, but in the case of these farm workers attached to um, to, fact, to, to to plantations with uh, modern equipment, uh, uh, tractors, uh, and what else, so, uh, they are smaller in number. And uh, when it is harvest time, or it, when it is planting or harvest or harvesting time, uh, the seasonal workers may come to the plantations, but to augment the steady core of farm workers in the agenda. So um, now, um, of course, uh, it takes capital for uh, the corporation running a plantation uh, to pay wages to the to the farm workers. And uh, from those farm workers, you extract the surplus value. Uh, if you make a, a detailed analysis, uh, the workers will only get so much, sometimes not enough for their subsistence. Uh, but the, the capitalist would certainly get his, uh, his uh, uh, surplus value from them. So now um, an interesting point uh, uh, you know, uh, there are those who try to minimize uh, the uh, size and importance of uh, Philippine agriculture and uh, farm and the, uh, and the peasantry, and they do it this way. Um, so they they minimize the number of peasants by discounting the farm workers, uh, the seasonal farm workers who still belong to the working class. And they also forget, they also limit uh, the productive, uh, the productive uh, element uh, to the head of the family. But you see, what you see in agriculture, especially the, back, the more backward one, the backward type of agriculture that exists in the Philippines, everyone in the fa uh, family beyond 10 years old huh, work. Uh, it's a whole working unit, so they're all peasants. Um, and uh, the only time that they seem not to be peasants is when they do odd jobs in other farms or they go to the Manila if they, if they can uh, have some, uh, uh, if they can do some uh, other types of uh, earning an income by peddling or carrying things and so on and so forth. So then also the output value of agriculture is minimized. You know, most of the output of agriculture and the peasantry it does not even reach the market beyond the village. Much of their product is consumed by themselves. And that is never uh, taken into account. As it also, uh, if there is any uh, uh, marketing, it is within the village. Eh? And that is not recorded by the government. The, the Philippine government only, you know, 
uh, uses airplanes to survey uh, the, the fields. And then that's where they determine uh, the uh, output value, or especially in connection with the uh, consequence of storms or drought and so on and so on and so forth. Uh, but they never uh, take a close look at uh, how much the peasants. You know that uh, agriculture, the agriculture now uh, um, uh, accounts for only seven seven percent of the uh, of the uh, GDP. No, uh, and then uh, uh, industry. Is somewhat more than uh, seven plus uh, yes. It, uh, anyway, it's easier to uh, to to uh, extrapolate. If you mentioned uh, uh, sec uh, the service sector is fifty eight is over bloated, and it is a um, that sector is not a post industrial or an extension of industrial capitalist system. It is an extension of a backward eh, country. But of course, it does, it work, it uses a lot of uh, borrowed money from abroad, abroad a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, equipment bought from abroad. But anyway, um, um, really, uh, because of the neoliberal uh, policy, as uh, so much capital pours into the service sector, it's the um, it is the uh, what you are, what you call uh, the most thriving part of the big comparator economy, and um, <clears throat> so there is a minimization uh, of uh, the value of uh, the agricultural output and the uh, but the size of the the size of the peasantry in relation to the working class, industrial proletariat, is still uh, uh, admitted by the government as uh, uh, a bit more. So that shows the country is still agrarian and pre-industrial. But anyway, since the question uh, concentrates on how, how wage labor and capital are terms applicable, to uh, uh, Philippine agriculture, I think I've said enough to, uh, uh, to show that um, uh, indeed there are there is a part of the peasantry uh, that um, uh, become seasonal farm workers and uh, take wages, and there is uh, there is there is also the other type of. Uh, Farm workers resident in plantations, relatively stay stable there as uh, employees of the plantation, and uh, they receive wages. So, uh, and um, uh, the moment you uh, deal with wages, with wage labor, that means to say, uh, capital, the, the capital, uh, uh, the capitalist. Uh, uh, exist eh? uh, to uh, to deal with it. Uh, say, let's say, uh, Hacienda Lucita. Uh, well, it's agricultural. It plants uh, sugar mainly. Um, but then, you know, it's a it's a export crop. And um, uh, and the owners are big compradors, aside from being big landlords. Uh, so as big compradors, they're certainly capitalists. Um, so they, uh, from their export crops, they earn foreign exchange. Then they use the foreign exchange to um, to import to import uh, manufactures from abroad. And um, uh, as the as their business uh, thrives, so they will try to expand uh, operations. But uh, so uh, that is the general pattern of uh, a farm capitalist. Um, Hacienda Lucita is already farm capitalism, no? And uh, just like, you know, the plantations uh, that exist in Mindanao and Isabela, uh, in the Cagayan Valley. So, uh, uh, you know, um, 
some people think that uh, when you say capitalism is already operating, then the Philippines, uh, they jump to the conclusion uh, that the Philippines must already be an industrial capitalist, no longer agrarian and semi-feudal. Uh, and they make the they make the uh, poor peasants and the landlords disappear just like that, no? By false claims. Um, with regard to the beginnings of capitalism in the Philippines, um, they uh, they uh, arose as early as the 19th century in terms of commodity production. Even if there is no industrial production, you see. Um, the capitalists are in the form of mercantile capitalists. Eh? They arise as, uh, as compradors at various levels and or merchant users. And uh, even if uh, most of the goods being exchanged uh, are agricultural, you know, uh, when the friar states were formed um, and they made big states, so uh, those areas, the friar states specialize in export crops. Uh, sugar, tobacco, or abaca, and so on and so forth. So there are also other areas that specialize in rice and corn production. So there is trading. There is trading between the two uh, types of, of uh, areas producing different crops. And then there is also um, uh, trade uh, between the Philippines and abroad because uh, uh, foreign trade developed exporting agricultural products. So uh, I, as early as the middle of the 19th century, bartering in a uh, self-reliant um, um, natural economy of feudalism was already decomposing. It was already decomposing even without uh, but only to the extent that um, uh, commodity production uh, of a very agricultural kind and uh, uh, also the use of money uh, to make uh, com uh, transactions in the market, they've taken over. Um, uh, bartering in a natural economy of um, self-sufficiency uh, would apply only with kept on dwindling. So uh, you might say the cash nexus took over. Um, and uh, it's because commodity production, production of uh, things for the market developed. Uh, so uh, there are those who think that uh, the Philippines is capitalist uh, miss the point that the Philippines cannot yet claim to be a fully capitalist country uh, beyond the sense of uh, using the, the system of commodity production and using money in the market um, because there are no, no, no basic industries and heavy industries as lead factor of industrial development. That's what is missing in the Philippines. You, you cannot call the Philippines an industrial capitalist country or a newly industrializing country. No. The Philippines up to now does not produce capital goods. Uh, these capital goods are imported and uh, so on and so forth. Um, but uh, there are inroads of uh, the capitalist mode of uh, production and especially exchange in uh, the countryside, in agriculture. Uh, for instance, in the countryside, uh, it's not mentioned, no? Um, um, in the countryside, uh, there is also uh, something new uh, under the U.S. colonial regime. The mines were opened. And uh, when you operate mines in the countryside, you pay wages. Huh? That's also an expression. But then, you know, uh, the, kind of, uh, the kind of production, non-agricultural, uh, the, non the kind of production that you have in the Philippines are mainly uh, agricultural and uh, extractive. Uh, ex uh, extracting raw material, uh, uh, excuse me, extracting mineral ores. That's what is done by the mining companies. Uh, the ores are processed elsewhere, abroad. All right. 
Oh, um, I think um, that's the last question. So if um, to all our viewers, if you have questions for Tito Jo, you could uh, drop it down sa comments. And later on, after the break, we will have a question and answer portion which Tito Jo would answer it. No, But for now, we will have a small break. So um, this is Busabos ng Puhunan mula sa Tambisan sa Sineng. Kayong sa gabit araw ay laging nagpapagal Kayong sa bawat oras yaman ang iniluluwal Umubuhay sa buhunan at sistemang sa inyo'y nagsakdal Sa hukuman ng mayaman, hinatulang tamad at hangal. Kayong pinarasahang maapi habang buhay, magsindi at pakainin at bigyan ng karangyaan. Para siti kong nagkahari sa lipunang kinasaglakan ng iyong uri. Sala manggagawa ng isinilang Ito ay hindi kapalarang Sinabi ng hari at paham Hindi kapalarang, hindi rin pagsubok Na sinasabi ng simbahan Ito ay isang kalagayang Sinadyang sa inyo ay gawin Na dapat masakin at dapat baguhin Ito ang inyong tungkulin Wala nang maasahang Katarong ang daratan Hanggat sa ating batas Ang salati mas matimbang Sa damal at katuwiran At sa buhay niyo't karapatan Malamun ang niurakan ng Panginoong may kapital Ito ay hindi kapalarang sinabi ng hari at paham Hindi kapalarang hindi rin pagsubok na sinasabi ng simbahan Ito ay isang kalagayang sinadyang sa inyo ay gawin Na dapat wasakin at dapat baguhin Ito ang inyong tungkulin Makasaysayang tungkulin Nakamute. Hello po. We are now back sa ating um sa ating educational discussions. The floor is now open po for all the questions that you may ask for Tito Jo. No, um shout out lang po with um the um to uh, Yusek Lorraine Badoy and the rest of the NTFL Kat Gang. If you have questions, if you have uh, questions po sa discussion, you can now ask. Just drop it down the comments po. And uh, we'll answer it. Uh, Tito Jo will answer it. So previously, Tito, we have a question from an audience. It is um, sorry, po. Um, how does that? Uh, this is from an audience, uh, Joven Francis. How does the tendency of rate of profit to fall work in a semi-feudal and semi-colonial economy like Philippines? And how does mercant or comprador bourgeoisie capital work in Philippine economy? Um, I will um, uh, begin by giving some examples, easy to understand. So let's say, you know, uh, uh, in, when I was uh, young, uh, there, there was a, a, multi, a proliferation of people in my hometown who bought popcorn machines. Uh, 
you know, they, they imitated each other because uh, it was, uh, 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 you know, uh, many people bought popcorn, but too many, too many entrepreneurs uh, producing popcorn <laughs> eventually collapsed, no? <laughs> the, uh, uh, that sort of enterprise, no? Uh, yung ano naggaya gayahan dumami yung ano producing the same thing huh? so that's uh, 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 example of overproducing something and then you know when you just may you, you make popcorn uh, with the use of a machine that you bought uh, well people can you know can cook uh, corn anyway in the province uh, whether you boil or uh, or uh, roast the roast the pop the the corn no so now, I give you a little example. I give you a big example. Um, let us say there was a building boom, uh, construction boom in the Philippines. Say um, uh, it, it went on from 1994 uh, to uh, 1970, 1997 up to the time of the Asian financial crisis. So, uh, the Asian financial crisis occurred, you know, the exports of the Philippines of semiconductors and so on, and uh, other types of exports suffered, no? So, uh, employment went down, and uh, it, there would be a, uh, a fall in the occupancy of the buildings built from 1994 to 1997, no? So, you have a case of oversupply, glut abroad, because... Uh, the Asian financial crisis occurred because, you know, this overbuilding, uh, too much building that cannot be occupied, no? And then uh, the financial crisis also came, and so that would bring down, uh, bring, bring down uh, uh, employment. Now, in the Philippines, you know, there has been this big boom since, uh, I think, uh, sometime 2000... 2004, there was a revival of the the construction boom. It has been going on, and um, so there are there are uh, uh, office buildings, buildings for residents, the uh, the upscale and the uh, low level. You know, you know the condominiums uh, that uh, have only a space of 25 square meters <laughs> are sold. That's for the benefit of uh, uh, low-wage low earners uh, who don't want to waste time through traffic, no? So, now, with the economy deteriorating because of this uh, um, this uh, 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 worsening crisis that was already occurring even before uh, COVID and with that crisis now aggravated by COVID, 19 crisis, I'm sure unemployment will go down and then uh, there will be a, a relative, a big uh, surplus of uh, spaces in all those condominiums you know, uh, built. No? Uh, people uh, uh, who rent are now in trouble because they did not, did they, for two months they did not earn anything and their employment is uh, is uh, in uh, is at risk of being lost, no? So, um, anything in the Philippines can be overproduced, no? Uh, so, uh, but uh, in most cases, the crisis come from the outside because the Philippine economy is determined from the outside. Uh, it's uh, the uh, uh, most of the of the money that the Philippines make comes from export of certain things. And uh, uh, or uh, there is money because uh, there is much borrowing from abroad, no. And when there is crisis worsening abroad, that is that affects the Philippines. And uh, the Philippines is now very much affected uh, by its own crisis as well as by crisis from abroad because the world capitalist system is in trouble. Uh, now. Um, <clears throat> The uh, rate of profit can fall uh, if when uh, many capitalists compete eh, 
in producing the same thing. And uh, uh, within the national economy, there are limits. There are limits uh, to being able to sell what you produce. Um, there are different except food, no? Um, but there are things produced in the Philippines that uh, uh, be, that go into a glut eh, relative to the poor demand, no? So much of the demand comes from abroad, no? That's how uh, the Philippine economy is predetermined. So uh, the, uh, you know, semi uh, feudal is the economic term. Semi-colonial is the uh, political term in describing the Philippine situation. It refers to, you know, not really being uh, sovereign or not uh, fully sovereign. Eh? But when you refer to the social economy, you use the term semi-feudal. It's, it's a kind of economy that is no longer feudal, but uh, the ruling class no longer. The ruling class is no longer the landlord class. If you have to single out the ruling class, the ruling class is the comprador big bourgeoisie. Eh? The Ayalas, the uh, Sorianos, the Billiards, and so on. Uh, these are people who, who have banks, serve, and they serve as, uh, as um, um, the chief financial and uh, trading agents. Uh, they are not industrialists. Uh, they are not industrialists. Uh, you know, it's always fashionable to say there is the sugar industry in agriculture or uh, there is the construction industry and so on. But uh, when you look closely at what kind of equipment being uh, is being used, it's important, no? So uh, it's a, it's, uh, the Philippine economy is still agrarian, semi-feudal, and uh, extremely dependent on exto uh, exporting uh, raw materials and um, importing manufacturers, including capital goods, and other uh, uh, and uh, consumer things. Um, now, the Philippines is always in deficit, no? Just like the government, always in deficit. Well, government probably can be taken care of by raising the tax burden, but uh, when it comes to deficits in foreign trade, the Philippines always has to borrow from foreign banks, okay? So the, the foreign debt burden keeps on increasing. So that's the case of the Philippines, that, uh, as ruled by the Comprador Big Bursa. You know, the Big Bursa, the, the Comprador Big Bursa is replicated from level to level, no? And at the lowest, you know, at the lowest level in, uh, at the lowest level in, uh, uh, in the Philippines, you have the merchant usurers, usually barangay captains, uh, or rich peasants, you know? They, they double as uh, money lenders, uh, people who are in need, and then uh, they they keep on, they eventually because there is no industrial development, what they earn eh, cannot be invested no? <laughs> in industrial projects. No? And so uh, uh, when you accumulate money as a uh, merchant user, you buy land. So uh, the landlord class is ever is always replenished. Eh? Old landlord classes disintegrate because of the natural process. Huh? When you come to the third generation, the land, a big state has been cut up. Huh? Huh? <laughs> but uh, there is the, the, the uh, uh, feudalism in its purest form involving tenancy, shared tenancy, is always replenished huh? by this bourgeois phenomenon of the money lender. So this is, you can see here the how how uh, capitalism as a modern thing and uh, and uh, feudalism as an old thing combine, no? and and so as you go up uh, at, at the to the provincial level you have the uh, town level and provincial level you have the uh, you have the uh, 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 landlords involved in some amount of mercantile capitalism, and they become even bigger when they become bureaucrat capitalists, when they use their public office and uh, their public office to uh, amass wealth. No? So that's the thing that rises up. Yeah, so you have a problem of U.S. imperialism, that means subservience to uh, foreign uh, 
monopoly capitalist power. You have still have domestic feudalism, but uh, it is already diluted eh, by Mer by comparador capitalism. And uh, um, I see in the Philippines uh, that there could already be a glut that will be that will be completely exposed. The, a, a glut in private construction, in having shopping malls, eh? and uh, <clears throat> I don't see any glut in industrial production. Uh -huh. <laughs> there is a positive bit. So it's much, the Philippines is very different from, let's say, the industrially developed countries. And then agriculture will, a glut occurs when the demand, no? the demand will, uh, ab from abroad, Will will uh, will go down, and uh, even the even uh, treating labor as a commodity, no, even the export of cheap Filipino labor that can be adversely affected because of the uh, economic uh, uh, fall uh, abroad, no, and um, so um, what is oversupply is uh, relative to. Uh, the decline of demand, no? And uh, uh, in the capitalist system, while something is needed by society, uh, the demand can rise when, when something is needed. So, and then capitalists can compete to produce that thing. But when there is relative too much of it, uh, the demand uh, falls. And so the falling rate uh, of profit uh, goes down. So maybe... Uh, at higher levels, the example of the corn, uh, the popcorn makers uh, would be equivalent to the makers of the shopping malls and uh, and uh, upscale, uh, upscale condominium uh, buildings. All right, Ito. Next question would be, uh, what is your suggestion uh, for people to further study the present politi political economy of the Philippines and its regions and provinces in relation to the world capitalist system? Hmm. Well, I think um, um, one is to use the Marxist analysis. Um, and uh, and uh, the teachings of Marx uh, come out uh, as uh, uh, as uh, the guide, especially because of the unraveling, the unraveling of the neo uh, liberal policy regime. You know, uh, neo liberalism is even worse than you know. Uh, the presuppositions of uh, Adam Smith, no? Uh, because, you know, Adam Smith recognized, like David Ricardo, recognized uh, that uh, uh, labor uh, uh, is the source of uh, new material values, okay? But the neoliberalism, uh, which was, uh, which was uh, a crackpot uh, ideology before the war, uh, uh, initiated by some Austrians, uh, the, there is a complete denial of the working class as the as the source of uh, new material values, and uh, so the, the capitalist class is considered the creator of wealth and the and the creator of jobs for the workers. The workers are just just passive; they're just uh, uh, taken to, they get called on for hire. And um, so the appearance of money, the appearance of prices, the appearance of the market are taken advantage of the capitalists to conceal the fact that values are created right there in the, in the production process by the working class. That is denied. And, um, uh, and that goes even against the, the teachings, the classical teachings uh, of, uh, of, uh, Mar of, of uh, Adam Smith, Ricardo, and uh, Marx, especially Marx, who made uh, an advance on on the labor theory. <clears throat> so, um, I know. Uh, the important thing in understanding the Philippine uh, uh, economy is outlook 
and uh, um, and the method of analysis. Uh, you know, uh, uh, to some extent, bourgeois economics uh, can be helpful because anyway, uh, it's it's the it's the thing that guides those who rule the economy. Okay, uh, but you must put yourself at a higher level. Uh, look over uh, what is the Marxist analysis and what is the the uh, the uh, analysis of the bourgeois economy. You know, uh, if you were uh, if you were Trump or Duterte or a big capitalist in the U.S. Oh yes, oh, uh, uh, you may even admit that uh, uh, the financial crash in 2008 uh, um, has continued to cause trouble and uh, uh, trouble uh, comparable, even more comparable or possibly worse than the depression of 1929 could occur, no? Oh, but you then, this is a matter of just bringing out uh, the stimulus, uh, especially after COVID-19 has devastated the economy. Uh, we need a stimulus package. And so what, what is the content of the stimulus package? More capital, more bailout money for the big, for the biggies, for the big, uh, <laughs> for the big corporations. And then they forget about you, the promises of, uh, of uh, food uh, and uh, uh, other forms, economic relief for uh, for the workers. Now, so uh, this is the way how to put it. How evil is the character of neoliberalism? It brings out the worst of the capitalist system. It denies the worker as a creator of values, and then it proceeds to um, give as much capital. Uh, the uh, to the capitalist that is supposed to uh, make the economy grow. So um, the wages of workers are pressed down. That means to say, the in the in the site of production, uh, the the uh, what you call what Marx is called surplus value increase. Huh? Then the corporations, the the biggies, um, are given tax exemptions. Then <laughs> uh, public assets are privatized. If they're profitable, like water uh, and other things, uh, they have not yet uh, commercialized the uh, the air. No, uh, you know they, they can do that. You know? what you do? Huh? How do you commodify the air? Huh? Uh, you pollute it, and then you sell oxygen tanks. <laughs> 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 the capitalists are smart, but they, they haven't got to the point yet. They, <laughs> they, they do a lot of damage to the environment, no? Uh, like fracking, they use fracking or even the, the conventional extraction of oil. Uh, they damage the, the environment. And then, of course, they, uh, they do all sorts of businesses that uh, emit a lot of carbon dioxide. So... Uh, all right. That's the uh, uh, when uh, I think the most basic thing to remember is the falling rate of profit comes about when many capitalists compete, and then uh, uh, the demand goes down, the profit rate goes down, uh, or tends to go down, and um, because uh, there is already a glut. Um, uh, this uh, profit can also fall abruptly uh, because uh, the Philippines belong to a global context, okay? Especially under neoliberalism, neoliberal globalization. Um, so uh, the Philippines was uh, producing a lot of semiconductors and other types of semi-manufacturers, okay? Uh, China kept on producing so much, okay? Then that triggered the Asian financial crisis. You know, the, the, crisis, the Asian financial crisis of 1997 was triggered not only by, you know, uh, overbuilding, uh, but also the overproduction of semi-manufacturers. So the Philippines, uh, uh, the, it became unprofitable. The profits kept on going down 
it became unprofitable to produce this the semiconductors. So there, there, there will be an abrupt uh, drop in the export of semiconductors because China uh, had already taken over, had already taken over the the business and uh, has been uh, and was producing uh, an oversupply of semiconductors. Then China dominated the uh, semiconductor business. Even the it became the main platform huh, for putting together all those uh, components, those com uh, those electronic components. So now uh, it uh, things have moved forward. No, the U.S. itself uh, realizes it bungled its economy by giving concessions to the to China. <laughs> now uh, that's another story. All right. Next question, Tito, would be: um, uh, How is the situation of the workers in the Philippines? The purpose of wage is for the minimal sustenance of the workers, but in Philippines. The minimum wage is not even enough for their basic sustenance. Yes, that is indeed a problem in the Philippines. Um, I have been in the, the, the workers' movement since the uh, 1960s. And of course, uh, um, the capitalist class and uh, it's, it's uh, and, you know, the bureaucrat capitalists and the supposed experts uh, uh, frown on, uh, dislike any suggestion of having a minimum wage. Once upon a time, a minimum wage uh, uh, was enacted, um, but then it was laid aside in accordance with the neoliberal uh, trend of thinking. And um, um, you know why uh, a, a minimum wage cannot be set? Uh, well, uh, the degree of organizing the working class is not that big. Uh, the uh, uh, only 10 to 20 percent is organized, so it's not strong. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, we like always to evoke the image of the. Uh, of strength or growing strength, but it is not that uh, 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 formidable. And the imperialists and the reactionaries have been clever at adopting measures to undermine undermine the working class movement, the trade union movement. They uh, under neoliberalism, they invented the concept of flexibilization uh, and. So short-term contractualization. You know, in a typical factory in the Philippines, 90, at least 90 percent are what you might call casuals, to use the old language, or those uh, the those whose uh, contract would be renewed every five months, because there is a law that if someone has stayed on the job for six months or more, then he can ask for uh, tenure. So uh, you have. Uh, so many workers, more than 90% of every enterprise, even the government is engaged in that sort of thing. Um, um, uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, let's say, uh, people are on short-term contractualization, they don't have, uh, their wages can be pressed down, they don't enjoy social benefits according to law, and uh, they can easily be threatened with being fired anytime. So um, uh, the basis for trade union organizing has been undermined. And um, it takes a revolutionary party to demand, to define and to demand uh, what are the things that must be done. Uh, otherwise, uh, that same revolutionary party would simply have to do uh, what's revolutionary? Uh, if, if the legal struggles, including the trade union struggle, uh, are not strong enough to change, uh, even only to make some significant reforms, uh, the revolutionaries, the proletarian revolutionaries, should do more work and uh, to uh, uh, to change the balance, especially where it counts most, no? by pursuing uh, the protected people's war after so long. And they should be able to, uh, to you know, from so many points nationwide, they should be able to to increase their strength by fighting 
you're launching tactical offensives. That's where, you know, that, that in the big picture, um, there is no self-limitation of the working class movement to, you know, uh, to, you know, submitting to, no, to neoliberal policies and regulations and uh, accepting, accepting the fact that, uh, um, that uh, there are many factors uh, overwhelming which undermine the trade union movement. So you can ask the trade union leaders uh, in the Philippines uh, how much uh, the movement has been affected uh, where, uh, as a result of uh, uh, this endo, né? this uh, what they call the uh, short term uh, uh, contractualization. The, all right. the, and and it always ends uh, five months before six the, <laughs> before uh, six months. Oh, nga, tito. And then um, next question, naman, tito. Um, can you elaborate more how capital is in contradiction with wage labor, especially now that we are under a crisis brought about by years of neoliberal policies and now a pandemic? Well, in the uh... In the more developed, uh, uh, well, in, in this capital, you will see, it's well demonstrated, you know, that um, <clears throat> uh, with the capitalist class competing uh, to uh, uh, build up their, uh, the organic composition of their capital means that, uh, you know, uh, don't bother about the global ego. <laughs> the, with, with, uh, 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 constant capital in the form of equipment, raw materials, and so on, being built up faster. Uh, and, uh, of course, <clears throat> when you build up your equipment, uh, especially uh, in this time that there are labor, so, uh, faster labor-saving devices, uh, and um, the, you know, the the graduates of business administration from Harvard and know how to, you know, how to make even more efficient the division of labor. No? So you, you need the, the work, the capitalist class tends to reduce the capital, the variable capital for labor, for, uh, for workers. Uh, workers cannot be totally dispensed with, but they can, their number can be reduced. No? Um, and uh, they can also be threatened with the simplification of processes through the division of labor. Uh, you, you can employ, it uh, uh, doesn't take much qualification just to get anyone. And the, the, the workers themselves are made to compete against, against each other in order to bring them down to lower levels. Uh, so, uh, so that's the case. Um, the... Uh, wages are being pressed down, and uh, uh, that's how the profits are first made. Uh, or uh, essentially, that's where the process, the, the the profits are made, right there in the process of production. Well, I'm gonna mute. Next question, Tito, from our audience. Sorry, po. Um, how does imperialism use commodity production to keep large masses of people in feudal bondage? Well, like free competition capitalism had already uh, uh, was the one that started using the commodity production. And, you know, commodity production arises from the bosom, from the womb of feudalism. Because in, uh, in the feudal society, there is trade no? between town and countryside. So there are the peasants in the, in the fields, and the, there are the bakers and handicraftsmen in the towns. No? So uh, they, there is a commodification already there when the, uh, in the course of exchanging uh, goods, um, in, the co in, the, in the process of producing goods is to sell to... Uh, not just a few, but to many, as much as possible. And uh, um, the, the, the goods must be useful and exchangeable uh, with the use of money. So then with uh, free competition capitalism backed up, uh, backed up by the revolution in, uh, in machine, uh, uh, 
large scale machine production no? um, so uh, uh, commodity production was then developed and then uh, uh, as uh, uh, let's say British capitalism developed you know the uh, British capitalism as a modern industrial power uh, was already practically an imperialist power uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, in the, at the beginning of the 20th century, there was an increase of imperialist powers, but the early bird uh, in being the imperialist power was England. And so uh, the England started the process of getting more economic territory abroad in the form of colonies, semi-colonies, and dependent countries. So it could get uh, uh, it get more sources of raw materials, cheaper raw materials, and cheaper labor. And um, it expanded the field of investments. Um, it was able to gain st um, uh, strategic points or entire uh, spheres of influence. So. That was that was the work of an imperialist power, <clears throat> and uh, by the time, uh, as so far uh, you know, uh, in the aftermath of the the eighteen seventy one Paris Commune, capitalism developed some more and uh, was hungry for uh, for foreign markets and foreign sources of raw materials. The super profits are drawn from abroad, no? Because of the falling rate, eh? because of the falling rate of profits eh? in the, in the national capitalist countries, the way to get the super profits is to get the cheaper, the cheap raw material. Um, so, uh, I know, but again. All right, Tito, next question um, from audience as well. You talked about farmers not benefiting from their own uh, produce. A case of alienation where the labor is dis uh, dissociated from his own product of labor. How do we combat another type of alienation where workers are alienated from their own fellow workers, often affecting the formation of labor unions? Well, I think yeah, you made mention of uh, um, uh, alienation in the in the production process. Um, the most important kind of alienation that occurs is when the when the capitalist uh, uh, accumulates capital, and that is what you call concealed congealed labor, accumulated labor, or another expression is uh, dead labor. Dead labor or concealed labor is made to dominate living labor. Okay, and that's what I've been uh, trying to explain. That uh, the capitalists build up the uh, uh, the constant side of uh, the the constant kind of capital, and so that it can it can and then it uh, presses down. So that's one alienation. But indeed, indeed, alienation. Um, as I pointed out, workers. Are made to compete with each other when you know employment um, 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 if employment is so uh, is so high then you have a big reserve army of labor uh, meaning to say unemployed competing with those employed um, those employed especially if they have no unions uh, they would they can they can be threatened with removal easily uh, so, um, so there is that the, the surplus uh, uh, labor from the peasant, in the case of the Philippines, from the peasantry, as well as from the urban slums, uh, this constitute the reserve army of labor, and uh, they're over eager to uh, take jobs, and they can be they can be manipulated, and so uh, let us say if a union will. Uh, or if the workers in one factory would try to unionize and they would call a strike and uh, to show their strength, 
um, the capitalists can hire uh, 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 some, uh, uh, you know, there are specialized groups eh, that engage in strike breaking. No? It's very well connected with the police. No? And um, uh, so uh, they bring in the, the scabs from the ranks of the unemployed workers. Uh, and uh, and then also there are the thugs. They, you know, people, um, unemployed people are made uh, into thugs to break the, the strikes. That's the, that's how. Uh, that's the worst form of uh, uh, setting workers against workers, you know. It's a very violent uh, process. But there is also, you know, the mentality, as I was pointing out, when you are white collar, you are above, you know, in the, above this uh, uh, sweaty kind of workers, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's also one way of alienating one part of the working class from another. Uh, so uh, I have to lay stress that both of them are being exploited, no? Um, but indeed, uh, indeed, uh, there are only a few lucky guys. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, someone has to be chosen as a foreman. And then the foreman, if, if there is no union, he will be more, certainly more, be more loyal to the capitalist employer and to his fellow workers, okay? And then you have the managers, and they're well paid. They're not workers anymore because they are, uh, they, they take sides with the, with the capitalists. You know, that, that, that <clears throat> I, will, I will compare that to uh, someone who comes from the poor becomes a part of the, of the exploiting class. In a village, uh, you may be a peasant, then you are recruited as an overseer, and you you are very much uh, you ma you are very much uh, uh, you you are so loyal to your landlord that you will uh, carry out orders um, made by him at the expense of the of the peasantry. That that's what uh, in uh, Maoist lingo. That's, that means the, uh, the overseer has become, is the running dog, you know, the running dog of the landlords. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, in class analysis, um, traditionally, you, um, you make it by considering some three points. No? Uh, who owns the means of production? Then another one, how is, what is your place in the Production. Social organization of production, and what is your share in the distribution of production? Now, a fourth item is very important. This is the uh, stress by Mao. Class is also determined by what kind of thinking that you have. You might come from the poor. You might even be the son of a revolutionary peasant or worker. But when you become, when the socialism wins, eh, you you get an education. And you become a bureaucrat, uh, you'd think uh, you'd frown on your, eh, your, your, <laughs> on the, the working class. You see, it, it also works in the continuing system of, um, uh, uh, that we have in the Philippines or in a fully developed capitalist country. Uh, you may be a lawyer, eh? you can be a lawyer for the union. Or you can be a lawyer just for just anyone whose uh, rights uh, have been violated. But you can be a lawyer and earn an income comparable to the income of the chief, uh, of the executives, of the high executives. If you work for the, um, if you work for the, the big capitalist. You know, I, I know people in the College of Law of the UP, they go to do a study labor law. Huh? When they return, uh, they, uh, some uh, would be side with the workers, but the others uh, would use their labor expertise, their expertise in labor law to serve the capitalist class. Uh, that that type of lawyer becomes uh, a part of the of the um, of the capitalist classes. Um, so uh, the political mentality. Uh, which involves having a certain class mentality, also is a 
uh, it's, it's often a deciding factor, especially when you have ambiguous cases. Uh, you know, the so-called middle class is a ground for ambiguity. Uh, you can go up or you can go down. No? <laughs> Uh, and uh, and then your mind uh, runs ahead of your actual economic situation, no? Uh, because you're in a hurry to make money, you would rather serve uh, the uh, the magnates rather than the poor people. All right. Next question, Tito. Um, how is the collective bargaining agreement or CBA? would work in a company or a factory now that contractualization of flexible work contract is prevalent? Well, if you have a contract, and it's a good contract because uh, <clears throat> this has been obtained through the, through the strength and militancy of the union, uh, it should be a good one, no? Uh, of course, in the process of, uh, of negotiations, uh, <clears throat> capitalists can do all, resort to all sorts of tricks and to be to bring down the demand and even corrupt the uh, trade union leaders but uh, we have good trade union leaders <coughs> and uh, and they have uh, when they um, when they organ or they have organized the workers and are ready to strike they have strength and um, uh, the capitalist is afraid of losing the business um, he may he may uh, um, he may transfer to another site uh, organize another set of workers, but uh, that's a loss of time and opportunity. And uh, so um, he makes a, an accounting, so long as he still gets a lot, uh, he will make some concessions to the workers. And the concessions for the time can be, uh, well, significantly better than the previous level of, uh, of wages. So uh, there are things that can be won by strong trade union movement. Uh, right. But they, you know, there are all different types of unions. There are, uh, there are yellow trade unions, there are pink trade unions, there are red trade unions. The reds, uh, you can assume to be the more, uh, the more steadfast, no? Uh, defenders of the working class. All right. And, uh, follow up question. Follow up. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Follow up question, Tito. No. Um, Ano? Ano ba? Follow question dito. Yung, uh, the neoliberal policies are forces the workers to be contractual as a part of suppressing the rights of the workers to unionize. How can we organize these contractual workers to participate uh, in unions? That's good. You, you repeated that question. No? Uh, it's part of your question, which I, uh, I missed. <clears throat> if, uh, when I said, if the contract is good, there should be a and elevation of the contractuals, the, the short-term contractuals, to uh, the level of the uh, regular workers. They should be given tenu uh, uh, tenure. Yes. So, uh, <clears throat> a, a, a collective bargaining agreement that, uh, that does not uh, meet the demand for making regular uh, the short-term contractuals uh, is not a good, uh, but you know, uh, there can be a push and pull. For, supposing the situation in a factory is that more than 90% more than uh, are, are uh, uh, short-term contractuals, uh, the dominant capitalists will say, oh, um, business no good, I have to, a lot of uh, loans to pay, uh, and so on and so forth. All sorts of reasons are given. So there is a push and pull. Na the trade union naturally will try to have all contractuals become regulars, but the capitalists can say, "Oh, let's uh, at this given time let's let's do it this way. Allow us uh, uh, to have uh, contractuals seventy percent. Then to another push. <laughs> oh, let's say fifty. Uh, you know." It's bargaining. It's a collective bargaining thing, you see. Uh, and um, a union may decide to uh, to win what it can win at a given time and um, and prepare for the day that you will push eh? push harder next time. So you, you get you you get uh, what you can get at a given time, and you you plan. You think that it can be your stepping stone for another because the workers. 
Uh, you know, even those who just uh, who, who are not so convinced by the unions, or those who don't even uh, join the union, when uh, so many uh, become regulars, they are encouraged to join the union. When you win some significant amount uh, uh, of uh, victory, then uh, it may not be the complete victory that you want, but then others will be encouraged to join the union that would make the union stronger. All right. Next question, Tito, um, from an audience. Is the quote from each according to his needs explains an economic function of supply and demand or it is a communist society going to be something else entirely in a sublation sense? When in a capitalist system, supply and demand uh, operates. And in a, in a sense, even a socialist society uh, will have to determine uh, um, through uh, research and state planning. Uh, you, you know, mm, a demand is not just something, supply and demand <clears throat> is not something that blindly occurs, no? Uh, it can be, it can be used to your advantage. <coughs> Uh, let us say, uh, I'll put it this way, in a social, socialist society, I, I need not explain no? how supply and demand works in a capitalist system. No? It's the market, for supposedly freely, but actually the monopolies decide things. Okay, So they, they have their own hmm, uh, top-level kind of uh, uh, planning, equivalent to state planning. But of course, they say the, there is still, no matter how much state plans, oh yes, Fascist state planning or uh, or uh, chamber uh, or chamber of industries planning, no, uh, you know, still you cannot remove the competition among the capitalists. Okay, so there is some amount of blindness, blind and uh, uh, with the market uh, may may the best commodity be sold more than others in the market, that sort of thing, but. In a socialist country, um, you can you can consider demand according to social needs. Eh? If you need more engineers, then you give more incentives eh? for uh, for uh, more students to take up engineering. You build more facilities, more you strengthen the faculties for engineering because you need the engineers for socialist construction. You get the point uh, from from the level of research and planning, you know what are the, 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 the social demands rather than the demands of the market, no? That's the difference. <clears throat> the uh, capitalists go by the so-called demands of the market, no? The law of supply and demand. Uh, we, the socialists, consider the social demands. Um, so we need, uh, for instance, in the Philippines, we need to uh, uh, put up st a steel industry. Naturally, we'll put it up. It's not yet there, but there is a social need for it. So you need uh, to, with COVID or epidemics arising, you need to strengthen your health, uh, uh, public health system. Otherwise, uh, it will be overloaded uh, <laughs> if uh, uh, you don't expand it. No, uh, So that's how Socialism handles the problem, right, this, uh, the matter of supply and demand. You cannot dispense with it. Um, the, the only difference is that you respond to social needs, whereas in the capitalist system, is, uh, they respond to the need for making profits from the market. <laughs> and they don't care about who, uh, who gets run over. All right. Next question, Tito. In connection... Is the withering away of the state going a realistic aspect of a Marxist theory? And how is the party going to actualize this? Is crimeless society possible without government? Is crime really a function of class? How does this hold up the psychoanalytic theories? I think I will go by uh, the statement of Lenin, which uh, Mao uh, Mao uh, echoed no? and, uh, and accepted. No? Uh, socialism will take a whole historical epoch. 
you cannot dispense with the state uh, so long as imperialism and reaction still flourishes uh, outside of a socialist country and inside the country in inside the socialist country you must also remember that um, when the exploiting classes are overthrown the capitalists are overthrown the resistance of those elements that believe in capitalism will be multiplied a thousand times, uh, 10,000 times according to Lenin. And of course, the international bourgeoisie uh, will make resistance, imperialist powers will make strong resistance. So you cannot dispense with the socialist state or the, or the class dictatorship of the proletariat while uh, imperialism has not yet been defeated. And uh, going by the historical experience of the Soviet Union and China, um, they were able to make advances in socialist revolution and construction, but then the problem of modern revisionism came up. No? And, um, uh, you know, if, in the long history, even in the time of Lenin and down to Stalin, uh, you have always, always uh, to... Uh, two kinds of opportunism, left and right. The right one would say, oh, let's make use of capitalism still, so as to make sure. And Lenin um, himself used uh, um, the new economic policy, certain uh, uh, concessions uh, to, the, to the rich peasant and small traders and entrepreneurs just to revive the economy. But there are those who think, like, um, let us say, uh, Bukharin, he would not like to, uh, he would like to perpetuate new economic policy and even uh, expand. It's, uh, it's uh, um, expanded so that, uh, and uh, this would generate capitalism. But Stalin, no. Oh, we have to b uh, start the uh, building the socialist industry and collectivizing agriculture. So that was the debate. And then, of course, there will be Trotsky, whose interest was supposedly to uh, still to foment the international revolution, whereas uh, uh, Lenin wanted to consolidate uh, a power uh, because uh, the, the Soviet Union had undergone uh, a severe kind of civil war and uh, uh, fight against the interventionist powers. So it depends on the conditions uh, how uh, socialism may uh, ex insist on its own existence and develop. And then, but um, uh, aside from the dangers posed by the international bourgeoisie, chiefly the imperialist powers, you must make sure that inside uh, revisionism does not arise. And revisionism arises this way. It, uh, in, a seeming, in, a seemingly, in a seemingly innocent way, you know, yeah, so you expand uh, the expand the number of people who are educated. You expand the state and uh, uh, to serve more people, and uh, you expand the economy so people get employed. Uh, first, they will acquire the petty bourgeois mode of thinking, and then they 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 read up on on developments in the industrial capitalist countries, and oh, they do things. It will take us a thousand years to reach this level, so we better uh, cooperate with them. If they offer, if uh, Germany offers loans, let's accept. If the U.S., uh, uh, then we accept loans, and we, or we make certain reforms. We make use of cap uh, capitalist measures to ensure that socialism advances. So, and then the, these measures should be exaggerated or in ways, they are turned into ways of uh, subverting the socialist economy. And, uh, <clears throat> and this petty bourgeois mode of thinking can generate um, uh, policies at higher levels of the uh, uh, of the party and uh, the state. Because you see, uh, uh, you know, as the old revolutionaries become old, they rely on uh, uh, on the younger, the the bright, the young, <laughs> young, uh, young, uh, what is this, uh, experts, you know, to advise them. <laughs> and if these experts uh, um, those experts uh, uh, become polluted with the bourgeois ideas, 
well, uh, they will give the wrong advice. And then even the old readers, eh? uh, uh, they might have been all along, they might have carried the germ of uh, opportunism, right opportunism and revisionism even before, like Deng Xiaoping, no? Eh? <laughs> so, uh, uh, the, so the younger people would have their own revisionism, some of them, and then at the higher level, there is also a, a revisionist guy, and before you know it, Mao Zedong would be reversed. The line of Mao Zedong would be reversed in, in, uh, in China. So that's the problem so far. <clears throat> but uh, there are certain generalizations can be made. Uh, <clears throat> uh, socialism shall have developed in terms of, uh, in terms of economy, politics, culture, and uh, uh, so strong that it is re and outside maybe imperialism is not yet completely defeated but it is it is totally discredited and it has lost power somewhere and uh, maybe total eradication of imperialism uh, may not occur and yet socialism can begin eh? can begin to sort of uh, dismantle the state machinery of coercion it's possible, but we have not yet seen that kind of situation. So far, we have seen only the Soviet Union hard pressed by the Cold War, and all, and then modern revisionism corroded it from the inside. Then in China, you'd think that uh, Mao Mao's theory of continuing revolution under proletarian dictatorship would ensure socialism, uh, but after, soon after his death, Deng Xiaoping would be. Um, would be uh, able to make a call. Uh, so uh, sometimes some people think, you no, know, if Stalin was tough, uh, tough on revisionists, uh, on those who are off the line, uh, uh, Mao must have been too much of a nice guy. He he, <laughs> all, he, he thought he thought uh, he thought that uh, Deng Xiaoping was rehabilitated. And he believed his promise that he will not take, uh, 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 he would not uh, strike back. When, uh, and then they allowed him to, uh, they, they got him back to high positions, you know. So, so from by it, no? Eh, alam mo gagawin yan? Kung ako lang, i-retire ko na, matanda naman eh. Matanda <laughs> ako, pero matanda rin, ba? I-retire mo kasi pa wrong line eh. Di ba? But if you... If you, you believe they're rehabilitated, ay, nako, gagantian. Irritan mo na with a good pension, no? Uh, <laughs> that's better than, you know, allowing him to make trouble for socialism. Or <laughs> vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next question, Tito. Um, anyway, uh, anyway, for our audience, we are we have already closed the floor for the questions, and thank you so much for participating. We are down to the last two questions that we will um, ask to Tito Jo. Um, next question, Tito, would be: Where in Marxist political economy do we find this semi-feudal and semi-colonial characterization of a society? And what is your basis for having conclusions that the Philippines? has a semi-feudal mode of production. Mm -mm. I think uh, uh, in, our, in our, one of our discussions, Shulalin, um, I mentioned that Plekhanov uh, mentioned uh, the coexistence of uh, 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 so much feudalism. Eh? Uh, Russia was a vast country with an ocean of I said feudalism and uh, and medievalism, and then you have enclaves of cap industrial capitalist development, uh, like Petrograd, Moscow, and uh, Baku. Russia could make tractors then, and it had plenty of supply uh, um, of fuel, no, industrial fuel, and it has uh, led plenty of uh, of uh, raw materials to process. It had steel plants. And it could make tractors, okay? So, um, Plekhanov said, first, the bourgeois democratic revolution must be made. Uh, and then, the socialist revolution. Uh, the difference between the Plekhanov, uh, Lenin, Lenin agreed that there are such two stages 
in the in the process of the revolution. But the big difference between Blekhanov and Lenin was that uh, uh, Blekhanov thought that the bourgeoisie must lead eh, the bourgeois democratic, because after all, it's bourgeois democratic. No? Now, uh, uh, Lenin said the working class must lead the democratic revolution, the bourgeois democratic revolution, so that it can proceed eh, immediately to socialist revolution. Now, Mao developed this further. Of course, uh, Rus Russia was an imperialist power. It was such a, it had uh, a few industrial enclaves, it, but it was such a, a huge empire. Tsarist so empire was so huge that when it became, uh, it was transformed into, uh, into the Soviet Union, um, like England be able to pull so much resources from its colonies, eh? uh, you have a, a, a vast territory from which you, to draw resources. You can easily put together resources. So that's an advantage of Russia. And when uh, after, the, after the difficulties in Russia due to the civil war and uh, the uh, fight against the foreign interventionists, uh, um, and uh, well, for a while there was a new economic policy, but then Stalin started full scale uh, industrialization by 1924. So um, <clears throat> you will see there that uh, Russia could really develop socialist industry. I pointed out also before that um, to make socialism, you must have the political power first. Uh, you have the political power to take over all the commanding heights of the economy and then to start your full-scale socialist industrialization and uh, uh, collectivization and uh, a mechanization of your agriculture. Well, you do things stage by stage. There are the five-year plans. Um, so, um, now Mao uh, had a condition similar to those of the Philippines now. What was China's yesterday is the Philippines uh, today still. The semi-polonial and semi-feudal conditions. Um, and um, the, the political economy regarding this has been well developed from Lenin to uh, through Stalin to Mao. And uh, these have gone repeated analysis in various countries where conditions are similar to those of China in pre-revolutionary times and the conditions in the Philippines. Um, the, the CPP, the Communist Party of the Philippines, follows, follows the line set by, um, by uh, uh, China and uh, fully clarified in theory and practice. It goes this way. Um, the... The bourgeois democratic revolution is of the new type because it's already led eh, by the work by the working class. And why is it? Why do you call it bourgeois? Well, the bourgeois has also has still a major role to play, especially the petty bourgeois and the middle bourgeois. Eh? Uh, the no good bourgeois is the you know the comprador big bourgeois. Eh? But even then, in the United Front, you can split them to weaken it. Yeah. You get the point? The, the big compradors like to sell things in the countryside. They have to pay tax to the uh, people's government yeah? if they want to sell their products, if the products are still beneficial to the people. You get the point? So uh, <laughs> this is what the uh, infantile Maoists, they cannot understand, no? how United Front is, uh, is uh, utilized to employ, to serve the revolution. Uh, some some apologies for for Gonzalo say oh Sender Romanis contrary to the claim of uh, 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 contrary to the claim of someone um, uh, did not choose United Front they had a good United Front to the petty bourgeoisie they were strong among teachers and other professions of course but the United Front tactics United Front policy. It's not just uh, <clears throat> uh, developing the basic alliance of workers and peasants, winning over the middle social strata. It also involves splitting 
eh, splitting the ranks or taking advantage of the splits among the reactionaries so that you can isolate, eh, you can isolate the worst of the reactionaries. So that's the that's the case. And uh, all these things, all these uh, learnings come from the extensive and successful experience of China. And you know, uh, uh, there is a great deal. Uh, to thank the Chinese successful experience for, yeah? uh, without protracted people's war, you know, the military makes kanchao, no? oh, you've been fighting for more than 51 years, huh? uh, and you have not taken yet over, uh, Duterte is still in the presidential palace, no, <laughs> the, the big success of the protracted people's war in the Philippines, it, it has succeeded, in establishing the people's democratic workers, that's which you call the local organs of political power, constitute the people's government. And they exist because there is a people's army as the main component of state power. And you have the mass organizations. Okay, and you have the United Front, uh, you know, the, all alliances. So uh, this would not have been possible without the teachings of Mao. Um, uh, and the Philippine... Um, if you consider the calidad, no? the quality of the um, of the communist before the re-established communist party, the old communist party of the Philippines, they will not be able to handle a situation in which the Soviet Union collapsed. China itself had become capitalist, no? And, but still, you have a uh, you have a burgeoning burgeoning uh, revolutionary movement and government in the Philippines. And that is an exceptional uh, uh, achievement, and the Philippines can be one of those factors for the uh, for the perseverance of the the of the international struggle for um, for reconst for resurging uh, uh, for making resurgent uh, the world proletarian revolution through the anti-imperialist and democratic movements. So, um, you know, a, a party of lesser uh, metal I would have uh, given up, just like, you know, the revisionist parties uh, in Europe and uh, in some other places, you know. Uh, the, the old members uh, failed to, uh, to, to make the young, to attract the young people to join the age and then uh, their uh, favorite point of reference, uh, Soviet Union is gone. Uh, so, uh, uh, what they do is to to uh, uh, to turn to make a foundation to show them a sort of pension, and they forget about making revolution. All right, Tito. Thank you so much. Our uh, last question would be, Tito. Um, the national uh, wage is being pushed through, and uh, how can we assure? that this law would pass even though there are forces of bureaucrat capitalists in the government? The national wage law po sa Pilipinas, uh, how can we make sure that it will be pushed through? And well, you know, from year to year there is a demand. Huh? If you can, uh, you can trace the, you know, how much was being, at the given time, there was uh, a demand for 250 pesos as minimum daily wage that because conditions continue to deteriorate, uh, the Philippine peso, uh, the value of the Philippine peso has been reduced, so that is an adjustment, no? So how much is it now? So the, the, the demand, but you know, from year to year, um, um, the demand has been frustrated. So uh, my only advice with regard to that is to keep on demanding. Um, because if you give up that demand, then uh, you surrender. That's a, that, that's an uh, unacceptable thing. Uh, well, you do the best uh, you can do in demanding. Um, if the demand is fair, why not? Uh, uh, you'll, uh, the purpose of uh, um, the purpose of making a demand that is fair and just uh, is to demonstrate that the your opponent is. Uh, unfair and unjust, no? And that's a big help to the to the armed revolutionary movement. When, when the workers uh, in their legal struggle are not getting what they deserve uh, uh, that is fair and just, oh, that is a justification for, uh, for the armed revolution. 
if uh, intellectuals are being suppressed, the freedom of assembly and uh, expression um, is being suppressed, or the batons of the police are smashing the, the, the heads of the students eh, and the teachers, no? Well, uh, that's not a good thing, but in another sense, it's a good thing too, because uh, the determination to make uh, revolution becomes stronger when there is so much injustice. See, you get the point? Uh, I want to stress the point. You can always make a fair demand, even if it's frustrated from year to year. But it's better to make it rather than to fall silent about it. Because silence will mean acceptance, what is unjust and unfair. All right. Follow up lang, Tito. Um, how do we calculate or how do we know what is the fair national minimum wage or the minimum wage? Well, computations can be made, you know. Uh, then, uh, let's say the, 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 the economist of the government boast of growth all the time. So you have a basis in terms of statistics. Uh, but of course, uh, much of that is, uh, involves lying, no? Um, so you will have to have a, you have to strike a set, a balance uh, between the reality and what you want to get. So um, the important thing, as I said before, the important is to improve on the reality with getting, uh, by getting significant uh, uh, wage increases. Mm, I see. And uh, the... Uh, the weakness of the Philippine economy is no matter how you know how uh, no matter how high is the rate of the growth, you know uh, they boast oh, it's six to seven growth. No, it beats China or it's comparable to, uh, to that of China. It beats the other. Uh, the whole problem is it's a comprador, uh, big comprador kind of economy with the service sector over bloated at the expense of the basic productor productive sectors of agriculture and industry yeah. and there is a lack of uh, uh, there is a lack of uh, of uh, there is an absence of industries that produce capital goods so that's the main point all right pahabol lang dito pala mula sa um, international migrants alliance europe na question is artificial intelligence good for the workers yes eventually at first any higher technology, any higher technology will favor the capitalists who control research and development and who appropriate the work of, you know, the scientists and technologies, okay? Uh, they're first used uh, in their favor to make more profits, but science and technology um, resulting in uh, higher levels of productivity will favor the working class uh, eventually, especially if they take power and they build socialism. So, uh, didn't Marx point out in Communist Manifesto that uh, uh, you build on what uh, cap capitalism has already created, no? And you can even create faster and better what capitalism has created. So, um, uh, you know, <laughs> about, among op uh, overseas uh, contract uh, workers, we thought in the 1990s it was already a big deal if we would set up uh, eh, communic communication centers uh, using, you know, the the older uh, older stage of development in uh, in the internet. No, you know, in the 1990s still. Uh, um, but then we have this uh, now we have these forms of communication. We are using it. It's a creation of the bourgeoisie. And it is mainly used for their profit and so on. But we can use it for revolutionary purposes. Eh? Yes. Eh, and <laughs> eh, my, my favorite example is uh, if uh, eh, if the Tsar was in control of the train, but there were trains. Why should uh, why should uh, the couriers of Lenin walk instead of take the train? Uh, why should they uh, carry on their backs uh, walking? the copies of the Pravda, uh, they can use the train uh, because uh, the, the intelligence of the Tsar was not that efficient anyway. There are ways of covering up things you, uh, and you get news uh, faster than, let us say, uh, the means of 
uh, communications and transport uh, in in earlier times. Uh, now, we, you know, you can spread a message uh, in seconds. Uh, first, you have a problem. Uh, like uh, it appeared that uh, Duterte and Marcos uh, were able to make use of the uh, social media more than any other force. No? Oh, but I see now they're being outnumbered by people who are not being paid to uh, uh, to speak against the against the line of Duterte and the, the trolls. You know? The trolls are even being exposed and and they're being kicked out. No, uh, so uh, uh, the new uh, higher technology is good for the socialist cause. Uh, the important thing is for the working class to be aroused, organized, and mobilized, and eventually take power so that it can all use it can use all that science and technology can provide. No wow. Thank you so much, Tito. And um, that is the last question that has been answered. Thank you so much, Tito, for um helping us and teaching us today. Uh, Jan po nagtatapos ang ating discussion. Another productive day, no, ng pagkatuto habang nakukulong tayo dito sa ating mga tahanan ngayong COVID-19. Uh, pakasay mag-aral at matuto. Abangan po natin ang susunod na discussion, which is the value, price, and profit. This is next week, the 24th of May. Uh, same time and same place. So make sure to note this on your calendars and watch out for updates on our Facebook group, National Democratic Line Online. So few announcements lang po. Um, from if uh, last serie po, we are offering certificates of completion. No, yes, parang very school diploma po ito. So if you want one, just message us and uh, we'll uh, provide you one. And uh, next is uh, from... Um, the KMU, ano po, um, if you are in need of, uh, if you have problem, if, and, uh, you encountered, um, problems in getting back to work, pro uh, problema sa balik trabaho sa Pilipinas, no, idulog po natin ito kay, um, Kabong Labog, um, which is, um, the organizer of Kilosang Mayo Uno, no, um, just, Call or text 0908-163-6597 or mag-message sa kanilang FB page, Chairman Bong Labog. Uh, matutulungan po nila kayo uh, regarding your labor issues if you've encountered one, lalo na marami pong naapektuhan ng, uh, sa trabaho ngayong COVID-19. Ayun po. Um, next announcement, um, nasa YouTube na po. Oo, tama po yan. Nasa YouTube na po ang National Democratic Line Online. So if you would like to... Uh, um, learn more and um, uh, mabalikan yung ating mga previous topics. No, it um, you could visit the YouTube page um, ND Line Online National Democratic Online School, or um, you could follow or subscribe to Silakbo Media, and uh, you could see the videos there. Ano, this this series will be uploaded as well sa YouTube so um just watch it out no mas easier no parang vlogger na po tayo <laughs> joke lang ayun nga po so um Tito Jo ikaw po baka may announcement ka po ano yan salamat ako sa lahat ng ating taga pakinig uh, inaasahan ko na makiki na lalahok sila muli sa susunod kumpletuhin nila ang serye at uh, pwede silang uh, sangayon sa iyo eh kung pwede silang ano, kumuha ng uh, certificate no participation uh, sa seryeng ito. At uh, uh, mabuhay kayo. No? Uh, kahit matapos ang COVID crisis, walang lockdown, kailangan patuloy natin dit ang ganitong proyekto para yeah. magkakapagpataas tayo ng kamalayan at uh, yung um, pag uh, uh, napatas natin ating kamalayan at pati ating militansya uh, magkakaroon ng uh, mas malakas na uh, enerhiya, energy at uh, ang direksyon tiyak. 
Tama. Power to the people nga po, yun nga. So, uh, thank you Tito Joma ulit no sa pag uh, sa pagturo sa amin today. So, um sa ating audience, please invite more comrades and your more 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 friends and families to participate sa aming um, discussion para mas lumalakas tayo at lumalawak. Pag maraming namumulat, hindi po ba? Maraming salamat uli sa pakikibahagi. Ako po si Kasamang Christ. Kasama po si Tito Jo. Mapagpalayang gabi po sa ating lahat at mapagpalayang lap- hapon sa ating um, sa atin dito sa Europe. Iiwanan po namin kayo na isang kantang muog na buo. Pagkakaisa, pagsulong Narito ako Para sa pagwawasto Magdaluyong Narito ako Para ang galat-galat Na pulo Magiging muog Na buong. Pagkakaisa, pagsulong, narito tayo Para sa pagwawasto, pagdaluyong, narito tayo Para ang kalat-kalat na pulo, magiging muon na buo Pagkakaisa, paglaban, tagumpay sa ating bayan sa daibigan paglaya ng sangkatauhan narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa pagsulong narito tayo para sa masangaping Pilipino narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulo magiging muong Narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa Pagsulong, narito tayo para sa masang aping Pilipino Narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulong Magiging muong